Good evening, viewers. Welcome once again to today's episode of Straight Talks. While the world is paralyzed by the ungodly pandemic that has swept across the globe of men like an unannounced grim reaper, more than 3 lakhs of people have lost their lives and 40 lakhs are hanging in the balance. Gigantic economies have crumbled and just like them, ours is also crippling like a patient eater ice on the table. The topic for today's discussion is the economic resurgence in rural areas amid the coronavirus. But before we move on with the discussion, let's take a look at the short capsule that we have in play for you. The rural market is one of the most underrated and neglected economic strategies of the state of Meghalaya. Despite its beautiful varying climate conditions which under Copen's climate classification features a subtropical highland climate. Its summers are cool and very rainy while its winters are cool and dry. Meghalaya is subject to the vagaries of monsoon. The monsoons arrive in June and it rains almost until the end of October. This helped Meghalaya fit perfectly to the myriad options of agricultural produce. Unlike West Bengal, Andhra Pradesh, Arunachal Pradesh and Punjab, Gujarat, Orissa, Karnataka and the lights whose main focus of a substantial economic growth is focused on agriculture, Meghalaya is resting its pendulum on the wine stores and coal mining. We should perhaps learn from a closest neighbour, Assam, who is not just self-sufficient despite its gigantic population, but also one of the reasons why Meghalaya is still functioning as a state, food grains, meat, fish and even vegetables are imported from Assam. Meghalaya is yet to learn how to utilise the truest form of natural richness that Mother Nature has bestowed upon her. The facade of the city being the backbone of the economy still dominates and this neglect of the rural markets has continued to put Meghalaya in a state of dependency. Post-lockdown, rural economic startups is not just a cry for change, but the immediate need for change to resurrect a crippling economy. Before we move forward with our topic of discussion today, let me first introduce our panelists. First up, we have B.K. Solia. He is the director of Meghalaya Institute of Entrepreneurship. Welcome, sir. Thank you. And next, we also have Kong <coughs> VP uh, V. Pala from the Department of Economics, Northeastern Hill University. Welcome, ma'am. So let us first kickstart with the first question that is for you, sir. COVID-19 has put the world economies on a standstill. How great of a damage has it done to our state? That is, uh, in quantifiable terms, that's a difficult question to answer now because I think uh, the estimates and the surveys and the quantification of who has been affected, which other sectors, I think that is still to be done and it's going to be a huge massive task. Uh, but yes, uh, as in other states, as in other countries, Meghalaya has also suffered. Uh, especially I would say the rural, uh, rural areas have suffered quite a lot. But again, at the same time, I would say relatively less than uh, what we are seeing in other happening in other states. Uh, say, for example, there has never actually been a shortage of food in Meghalaya. Uh, and in fact, if we look at the rural economy, since we were talking, since this is about the rural economy, uh, the kind of farmer distress that we, you know, that was anticipated in the beginning of the lockdown uh, never actually happened. There have been few cases where, you know, uh, isolated cases here and there, but the government of Miguelé from the beginning of the lockdown had this uh, service in place which was called uh, 1917 items which actually went out to pick up farmers produce and uh, bring them to the consuming centers and also to markets especially when people were not able to get uh, you know fresh vegetables so they 
this service 191718 actually facilitated you know the evacuation of perishable produce from farmers fields to the consuming centers so mm. that way uh, it was not a scenario where farmers where you see in other states where farmers were dumping their uh, produce and lying it uh, leaving it in the fields to rot uh, given that uh, being that being said uh, the service uh, had to scale up uh, very rapidly, but there are still a lot of areas that uh, have not been uh, able to be reached out or tapped or even uh, addressed because I also am the member secretary of 1917 items and I know very well that there are places in the state where we have not been able to reach. And that is something that you know we hope that we can address going forward from now. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, speaking of uh, the rural markets and the contribution of the rural areas to the economy of the state, uh, can you give a brief, like maybe approximate kind of an idea of what is the contribution of the rural economies to the state of Meghalaya? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, in exact uh, estimation, in exact terms, it would be very difficult to, uh, to give this uh, contribution. However, we see most of the population in Meghalaya reside in the rural areas. And in the urban areas also, we have a lot of people or workers who come from the rural areas. Now, people who come and sell their vegetables in the urban areas are, are also from the rural areas. So, the rural economy basically is the mainstay of, uh, of uh, the state. Our uh, state is um, still dependent on agriculture in terms of um, employment of a large number of people, about uh, 60 to 70 percent of the workers are still dependent on agriculture in Meghalaya. So that is a huge contribution. So therefore, I think the, I mean, the health of the rural economy is of prime importance for the over health of the economy of the state. Thank you so much. Uh, we are also very glad uh, that one of the former, mem uh, former legislators has also joined us in this panel through a video. So ladies and gentlemen, let us take a look at what Sir or R.G. Lingdo has to say about this topic. It is true that Meghalaya has a suitable physical climate for agriculture and livestock farming. But unfortunately, it just ends there. The land holdings of the farmers are small and they have not been able to federate themselves to gain advantage of the economies of scale. And so their production costs are not viable when compared to farmers from the rest of the country. The landed costs of rice, vegetables, meat, and fish coming from outside the state is far lower than the cost of production locally. So, it is always cheaper for consumers to buy products from the market rather than to buy it from producers who are producing locally. However, having said that, in today's context, our farmers can go in for organic farming and find themselves niche markets to cater to. In speaking of the local market, uh, sir, I would also like to put this question to you. Meghalaya has one of the best climates suitable for different varieties of agriculture, yet we have to import almost everything from outside the state, particularly from Assam. Why do you think 
we have to import almost everything from Assam. See, um, I would like to say uh, support and also endorse some of what uh, Baarji has said. Uh, yes, we all talk about Meghalaya having, you know, a uh, uh, very good climate. We have plenty of water, uh, heaviest rainfall in the world, etc., etc. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that water, say for example, goes down the slopes because we are not impounding that water. Recent uh, in introductions in policy have also, we have, uh, that is the reason why this government has come up with the water policy where we are looking at water itself as a resource and as an asset for the state. But again, uh, again the whole issue revolves around mountain agriculture. So for example, the land tenure system that we have here is in such a manner that uh, land holdings are fragmented. The economies of scale don't work out. As what Baarji said, mm -hmm. our farmers are yet to learn to federate. Only by federating, only by coming together can you have economies of scale. At the level of production that farmers are producing right now, we cannot compete with other states in terms of rice, in terms of uh, commonly used vegetables. Yet, what we have is something like, again, what Baarji said, that we are organic default organic, so they say. We also produce a variety of uh, products that are not available anywhere else, number one. Number two is, is also off-season in many parts of the state, but we have yet to take advantage of these, uh, what we are, what I would like to call our USPs. I say that, you know, the, the, the COVID pandemic that is happening now is actually an opportunity. Because why? You see, if you look pre, before March or before February, the consumer focus was more on uh, eating well, on wellness. We were seeing the shift from, uh, uh, you know, uh, junk food or actually, uh, you know, highly processed food to more of naturally grown food. Then COVID-19 happened. And we are seeing this shift in the market and in consuming patterns where people are now shifting from wellness to immunity. And I think this is where Megala we have a distinct advantage because we do have products which are natural here, which are grown naturally, which actually can help to build up immunity. Uh, the Ministry of Ayush has also gone uh, out and you know uh, started trials on you know what kind of foods can build up immunity in the human body. A lot of the food that, a lot of the products that uh, Megala uh, produces, small quantities, but yet have not got the exposure that is required. And this is the time I think, you know, post this, uh, you know, pandemic, mm -hmm. this is the time I think we should take advantage of this because this is a market that is waiting to be tapped. The shift in consumer pattern is something that we need to really understand. And we can only do that only when, you know, when we go out to the rural areas where we actually start educating farmers. Not only that, but we put in place a supply chain because the problem with Megala agriculture is we do have, we've seen such beautiful products. The supply chain is broken. And this is what we need to address. And this is something that, you know, uh, Megala, we've been fortunate because we had a system. Before the uh, pandemic happened, we had a system. We had a system called 1917 that actually took produce from the farmers, brought it to markets and linked the farmers to markets. We had a system, it was operating on a small scale. But I think this is something that has actually saved our farmers this time. And we need to really scale up because the supply chain is something that not only Megara, the entire country suffers from. 40 to 50 percent of produce is wasted in the supply chain. If that 40 percent, we had a really, really uh, good functioning supply chain, that would not happen. Of course, there are so many things that need to be addressed in the supply chain, which I mean, as we discuss, we can talk about them later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rupa. Uh, uh, what, what is your take on that? Uh, yes. Uh, when we talk about agriculture and farming, the most important resource is land, you know. So in Meghalaya, as per the socio-economic census of 2011, three-fourths of the rural households, 
do not own land. Then oh, many research studies conducted in Nehu, in the Department of Political Science also, has f uh, these studies have found that you know farmers do not cultivate in their own land. What I mean, what I mean is that the people who take up farming do not have land of their own. You see, those who own land do not take up agriculture because agriculture is not remunerative enough. It's only the, the poor, only those who have no other livelihood option. It's only those who take up farming and that too they do it in community land where it is available and also they take land on rent from uh, those who, who own it. So, uh, and the, this rent is not regulated at all. And it varies so much from place to place. In some areas, the rent is about 50% of the produce. Imagine 50%, which means after harvesting, they will have to divide the produce with the landlord. So, this is the main problem. You see, so this um, regulating of rent or the issue of land ownership, the issue of um, giving land to the farmers, that is something that we have to really take up. Okay, because uh, now we see community land is being appropriated by a few powerful, let's say, elite people in the villages. They appropriate the community land for themselves. So, what used to be available for farming uh, earlier as, um, a, you know, jhum land for the masses, that is no longer available. So, that needs to be taken up. Then, uh, this pandemic has uh, taught us that we have to be self-reliant in as much as possible, especially in food. We need to be self-reliant. And as I said, in uh, Meghalaya, agriculture is uh, taken up by the, by the poor and by the uneducated. The educated mm -hmm. lot don't take up agricultural activities. So I think we need to change this with so much unemployment and there is so much demand. And now, now mm -hmm. what is the most demanded commodity? It's food only, right? Yeah. It, uh, various food items. So this is where the demand is. So therefore, the educated youth also need to take up farming. I mean, if we, if we look at, uh, you know, it, the developed countries, who take up farming? It's the educated people. So they bring in scientific farming, they bring in technology, and then the production, uh, the yield becomes more, you know, and then the activity becomes remunerative. So therefore, I think we should encourage, in, encourage in the form of incentives, in the form of training, in the form of a system for marketing. We should encourage the youth, the educated youth, to take up farming so that we take the, um, the we, we use the potential that God has given to our state in terms of this beautiful place, in terms of the uh, resources that we have in our state so that we can become self-reliant, maybe not totally, but to a large extent in terms of food production. See, I would agree, mm -hmm. if, you don't, if you don't mind my interrupting, I would agree mm -hmm. with what Kongpala has said. Everything he said is right. And that is where we have this, uh, that's the crux of the problem, actually. The problem is that uh, tendency farming, where people, you know, take land on lease mm -hmm. or, uh, or cultivate and Yes, she's also right, and I'm very, very uh, glad that she brought this up, is that, you know, uh, we have a saying in Kasimo, Nangrep Nasrdep. So, the more you cultivate, the poorer you become. You see, there are studies, proven studies, that say that if you bring in technology, if you bring in, uh, you know, a bit of, uh, of uh, marketing, uh, supply chain, technology, into farming, the returns from farming can go up as high as 60% which is far, far higher than industry. But the risk are also that high. See, risk mitigation also is something that, you know, uh, only people with an education can understand. But then how do we attract, and what Kong has said is very right, 
how do we attract young educated people unemployed to look at farming as a business if you look at a startup uh, uh, you know environment in india you see a lot of startups are there in the it space a lot of startup in the engineering space in the manufacturing space but very few startups in the agriculture space but yet that is one the, the one single sector that can actually change the destiny of our country and what is encouraging is that overseas i i work with a lot of entrepreneurs and over the last when we first started we had a lot of startup people who entrepreneurs who were focused on services on manufacturing over the last two years we are seeing more and more of our young local boys and girls who are focusing more on the agri sector on processing on value addition on supply chain mm. on markets so it's a welcome shift but i think this needs to be encouraged and you know a lot of this is driven by the e-commerce uh, market this is where we need to actually put in place policies from the government we need to encourage this because you see uh, the a farmer who's been doing it for endless years there's a limit to how much technology he can absorb but if somebody was there to guide him or actually be a partner with him to market to actually you know start you know putting in technology and bring in you know uh, uh, improve practices his production would increase rent being as it is we are a, a community and a society that uh, has holds a great value over private ownership of land is a very thorny issue we agree i agree with you kong i mean this the rent is high so then uh, so based on that ski uh, on on that whatever you have just said on on that topic on that context can we is it right to blame the rich people from shillong for such a crumbling agricultural practice that we have because if you take a look at uh, like in ribhoi district nearly almost half of ribhoi is being owned by the rich people from shillong and if you also take a look at all these lands in ribhoi district that uh, that can actually be cultivated they are being wasted by these rich people because they buy all of the land and they are not being used for example uh, the moment you go from shillong to nongpo you can see uh, the signboard where it is written h lingdo it's endless the property of h lingdo is endless so ma'am i would like to put a question to you here how much of the economic right in the constitution of india can work in the context of uh, the rich hoarding too much land against the poor um as uh, ba solia said <laughs> it's a thorny <laughs> issue it's a thorny <laughs> issue really but uh, it, it i mean land reforms has failed in many of the states in india so let us be practical let us think mm. of what is possible what can be done uh okay the rich may own a lot of land and uh, if there is a policy for regulation of rent you know that will solve a lot of the problem that will solve to some extent so uh rent has to be regulated and um, although of course still now we don't have a cadastral survey I mean putting land sealing in place that would be not that would not be possible at all in the foreseeable future so therefore if we take a small step in terms of regulation of rent you know that would uh, mitigate the problem see that is one mm. and also if you look at it from the other side mm. see the the uh especially in east castles private ownership of land is mm. the norm and uh, in a market driven economy it's the sale and transfer of land is economics people sell because they want money or they need money for something else they invest in something else and what you're saying about uh, you know uh, consolidation of land into a few hands that has been the story all over the world actually in fact uh, anywhere any country in the world the difference is that a lot of people who say buy this land also have the capital to invest mm. in improving the land now see for example 
uh, today I, I saw the news that the uh, government of Meghalaya has, uh, you know, the cabinet has approved the revised APMC Act, which is a good step in the sense that it opens up private sector investment into agriculture, and I think that is needed. Mm. Because, see, government can invest, and government is more towards development. Uh, government, as government, we invest in developmental schemes, in development of people, societies. Private sector invests in profit. They are profit oriented, they are efficient. And for that reason, private sector is much more efficient. There is, of course, this debate that goes on that, you know, to privatize agriculture. But then, if you're talking about the trends globally, I think Kong also knows mm. that corporate agriculture, while the extreme uh, version of it leads to consolidation of more wealth in fewer hands. But then a mix of corporate agriculture mixed with a little bit of government control or government oversight can actually benefit entire communities. We've seen that happen in Africa. We've seen it happen in many developing countries. It's happened in, uh, in a lot of countries in Southeast Asia. Countries like Vietnam have risen from you know, a war-torn country to now being one of the leading producers of processed products because of this you know, this wisdom of mixing uh, corporates with a little bit of uh, you know, public uh, socialism or public sector intervention. I think that fine line we have to find. Thank you. Uh, in uh, talking about the economic resurgence, we can see in the past few days that uh, our government has also uh, taken some bold steps into resurging the economy of our state uh, that is obviously by opening of wine shops but for for some reason or the other i oh, like we can see that maybe our state is too dependent on tourism and on coal mining so uh, i would i have put a question for uh Ling Do here whether we are becoming too obsessed with tourism and coal mining that we have neglected our main wealth, that is agriculture. Let's hear from him. Unfortunately, the biggest problems our producers have in the state is finding markets for their products. That is the reason why I am a firm proponent of using tourism as a catalyst to drive the state's economy. Tourism brings the market to the people and it has the capacity to drive all the other sectors be it agriculture, horticulture, livestock farming, handicrafts, sericulture and even give an economic reason for the preservation of our physical and cultural environment. However, we have to move away from the conventional model of tourism towards a community-based model of ecotourism for tourism to really work in our state. Efforts are already being made in this direction. We just have to strengthen these efforts and focus uh, a little better to ensure that the results are what we want. When, uh, when we talk about tourism and eco-tourism, eco do you feel, ma'am, that eco-tourism can work hand in hand? Uh, when we take a look at how the tourists of India are, let's say, for example, the Wa Um was not, it's not the same anymore. It's like it's because of tourism we have lost all that beauty. Aren't, uh, don't you think that we are, we are putting our beauty, the beauty of our state, in a very peculiar, in a very peculiar position by uh, by imparting too much of tourism because clearly we can see that we are a state that is not actually very much ready for tourism. Definitely. That is very true because the model of tourism that we have been following all along in Meghalaya is not at all sustainable. Our natural resources are being depleted in terms, let's say, the living root bridge. Too many people on any particular day. So there is no regulation at all. And yes, there are benefits from tourism, no doubt about it. But 
we are we have not been reaping the full benefits in terms of transport we see tourist vehicles coming mm. from outside into our state then in terms of the the food items that are being sold in the tourist spots are indigenous food items do not find a place there you know what are being sold the you know n definitely not the indigenous food items and so that is not clearly sustainable and it does not uh, really help the state in a big way so i would like to go back to what you said earlier when you said about land being wasted you know and uh, the land being bought by the rich people from shillong and all that you see we have been taken the easy way out it's easy to import food from outside because it's cheaper and so there is not much demand uh, for our local produce so if we take the cue from what uh, our prime minister has said recently we should be vocal for local right so we should try to uh, produce our own food there should be more demand and there should be restriction restriction of food from outside you know what is available within the state so that our farmers will will get the market that they need so then when there is an increase in demand for the local produce then naturally the there will be a shift you know towards more production and so the land that has been uh, lying idle for so long will be utilized right and as balio said uh, so yeah said that with uh, private investment and with uh, you, you know uh, with a combination of uh, capitalism and government control in this sector and then that's i think that's the way to go forward uh but uh, in talking about uh resurgence of the economy of the economy of the state uh, particularly if we put uh, if we put the rural areas in context how do you think we can research the economy of the state by putting the focus on the rural areas of the state because as you can see that um, clearly at this point of time we are also facing problems in transportation just the other day we have seen that a local taxi in latlingkot was being fined by the police 2000 rupees for transporting of vegetables so uh, how do you actually feel that we can we we can like motivate them and inspire them if all of this is happening at the very same time see that's uh See, this is also is a question that cannot be answered by focusing only on a single sector. Number one, uh, agriculture and the rural economy cannot exist in isolation. What is needed right now is post uh, going forward from now is actually see the the, uh, the example you cited. Uh, that may be a one-off example, but what we have seen is generally uh, our experience over the last one and a half months of. Uh, evacuating uh, produce from the villages is that uh, as a whole everyone is supportive but given that uh, situation looking at the rural economy in only in terms of agriculture will not solve the problem there are so many other issues that are there in the rural areas education is one mm -hmm. health besides agriculture if you don't have healthy people you cannot have productive agriculture education you need to educate people because otherwise you know whatever new interventions come in agriculture is very difficult for people to accept if they don't have a minimum level of education and you need you know uh, infrastructure is something that is also important because uh, say for example we talk about the potential of processing our products like kong said no uh, producing our own products from the state yet that requires power and until unless you are able to bring the production facilities or processing facilities as close as possible to the producing areas your cost of producing will go up too high and therefore for that to happen you need you know you need the whole infrastructure to be in place you need power to be there you need roads okay you need education you need health 
besides agriculture you need water okay you need finance our entrepreneurs our farmers need money also to invest mm. and that is something that you know has been discussed time and time again where you know banks are reluctant to to loan because again the whole history of defaults and npas also the fact that uh, a lot of our people don't have credit history so therefore it becomes difficult for a financial institution to also lend to such people you know what happened is that uh, today's uh, the, i mean yesterday's decision of the cabinet to amend the apmc act i think is a step in the right direction number one the fact that the water policy is now in place where we actually have uh, where communities have a say in how they use their water that i think is important and again at the same time as what ba rg said our people need to learn to work together see what happens we've noticed many many times that uh, when uh, uh, when a new scheme is declared a lot of people form cooperatives fpos fpcs mm -hmm. uh with the stated objective of working together and accessing markets together but when the money starts flowing in these societies break because why uh there's uh, this feeling of unequal sharing and all that stuff happens again markets is something that you know our people need to understand uh this whole concept of a market being what we normally assume as a place where you know uh, traders come and buy and where there is no oversight on uh, on the pricing there there's no oversight on the quality there's no oversight on the supply chains in that market that entire thing needs to change we actually have seen a lot of these things slowly coming together mm. but again as uh, as i would uh, as i keep saying to my people you know people who are my entrepreneurs time and time again is the government can do okay a lot of things can stimulate can catalyze change people have to be ready to accept that change and for people to be ready to accept that change that infrastructure that enabling ecosystem for them to go forward has to be there that is what is important a uh, what concept no the rent uh, uh, mm. you know the the rent control act maybe a rent on a ceiling on land the what barji said the tourism policy mm. okay what we are talking about so the agriculture produce policy <coughs> even your transportation that whole thing now needs to we need to see this is an opportunity for us to to uh, tweak to restart i think this is where you know uh, we need to come together it's not only me it's not only uh, a lot of people mm. so you know communities civil society government corporates have to come together because all this time people have been saying no it's government's job let government do it sorry is not going to happen until you the people people like you me or uh, entrepreneurs farmers come together and say okay it's time to change it will not happen it's more of a mindset see the money is there the government has the money they can mobilize the money the mindset uh very well put sir uh, like in and uh, when we talk about education just like you have mentioned education time and time again right now we are seeing that uh, our state is is being chained by an education not just our state but the entire country for the matter is being chained by an education system that forces a student to always be busy with books and we have seen that students are always busy with books and for the very first time ever since the lockdown happened we are seeing students going back to the paddy fields whereas uh, but if you take a look at what is actually happening right now each and every single institution in the state as well as in the country is focusing on online classes do you feel that online classes is the immediate need of the r because uh, at this point of time while we are in lockdown don't you feel that the students should actually do something productive because clearly we have forgotten how uh, forgotten about survival skills the the students have completely forgotten how to do household chores whereas at this point of time don't you feel that our state in particular is making a mistake of having these online classes and engaging the students in assignments after assignments whereas they should be doing the things that you have just mentioned um 
you know, uh, it's, uh, it, it varies. It's not the same. Of course, in Shillong, students are being bombarded with assignments. And I see my own children. The burden is more now than when they were going to school. So it's more because, uh, you know, they have a lot of work to do by themselves. And uh, in the rural areas with no connectivity, I think online classes are not happening at all. So students, uh, some of them go to the fields. Those who have the means, I mean, whose parents mm. are farmers, they go to the fields. But many are lying idle. Many are sitting idle. And uh, so this is a, a problem. It's a problem. I mean, education, if we talk about reforms in education or what should be the, uh, the education policy that should be followed, I think that will... Mm. Uh, that is a broad topic in itself. But yes, uh, whether students should go for online classes or not, that is the question now. See, for those who have the means, let them learn. I mean, just because the vast majority cannot learn, my opinion is that let them learn. You see, everybody cannot become doctors or cannot become engineers, cannot, uh, cannot reach to the highest academic level. Everybody cannot do that. And it's not uh, practical, it's not feasible also. Our economy, our state, our country needs people of different skills at different levels. So those who can learn, let them learn. But those who cannot, for the moment, uh, they should be encouraged to take up uh, some, yes, uh, productive activities. But I mean, when the country is in the, this lockdown mode also, of course, it is quite difficult for those who are from non-farming households. It's quite difficult to take up any productive or any gainful uh, activity. Um, uh, but um, when this lockdown is over, I think we need to, we need to uh, bring in some changes. I think we must have learned mm. some lessons from this pandemic in differentiating mm. what is essential, what is non-essential, what is relevant, what is non-relevant. So therefore, I think these things should be incorporated into our mm. education system. Yes, it is overburdened. A lot of irrelevant things, a lot of uh, unnecessary things are burdening the students unnecessarily. So therefore, we should learn some lessons in knowing what is essential, what is relevant, and what are the skills that students need to learn mm. while they are in school so that they, need, uh, so that they can survive. Mm. So we need to, to progress towards uh, that aim. Yeah. Uh, there are actually uh, quite a number of students that are also from the rural areas that are studying in Shillong. And uh, according to them, they say that uh, when they do not complete the assignments, the teachers would tell them, if you do not complete the assignments, if you do not submit this, you do not submit this on time, then if you do not complete the test, then they will not be given marks. So it is very difficult for them because, uh, we, uh, because of the connectivity. One is we have very poor internet connection. And sometimes when they do get internet, then the test is already over. The time to submit the assignments is already over. Uh, Ma'am, you have just said that uh, the ones who can learn, let them learn. But the problem that we are seeing here is that that is not the case. The teachers, the institutions, are forcing each and every single student to learn, to submit the assignments. How can the students submit the assignments and learn when they do not have the means and the resource? Right, right. I think, uh, you know, there should be some directions from the top, uh, from the authority concerned regarding this issue. I am a teacher myself. 
and we are also conducting these online classes, giving assignments and students have to submit. And so uh, our students also come from different parts of the region, some from outside Northeast, and uh, there are a large number of students from the rural areas. And uh, yes, we do give these deadlines that you mm -hmm. submit by this, this date, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, just today, I'm supposed, I mean, it's supposed to be the last date of one particular assignment that I have given, but then the students request, and so I extend it, okay, till the 31st of May. And I think we have to approach this with a human touch. You know, we have to understand the problems that student, uh, students are facing. We have to understand. So, uh, s teachers should not be so strict. And uh, of course, as teachers, we have to have that, that uh, you know, some degree yeah. of uh, that uh, yes. some degree of compassion, uh, some degree of compassion, and some degree of strictness yes. also, so that things can be done. Because yeah. there are there are students who are taking advantage and who are not doing the things that they are supposed to do, but there are a large number of students who are facing these genuine problems. Mm. So we have to approach this with a human touch. Okay, very well put, ma'am. Uh, we have to approach this problem with a human touch. Let us also see what uh, the ex-legislator also has to say when it comes to the problems of the students in the rustic areas. Definitely, we can take advantage of the fact that post-COVID the movement of people and goods are going to be restricted. The Prime Minister has al already called for going local. And I think we have seen how an economy based on local produce and local marketing can be developed and encouraged. However, the government of Meghalaya has to go for a concerted effort of capacity building backed by requisite budgetary provisions in order to facilitate this. So in, in talking about in talking about rural economic startups at this point of time, but what according to you is the best rural economic startup at this point of time? That is a very tricky question. Because see, a startup, we have to understand why would somebody start a startup? Okay, because the person First of all, it presupposes that the person is an entrepreneur. Because until unless he's an entrepreneur, he will not go for a startup. Second is that it presupposes that there's a market. Okay, the purpose and objective of a startup is to start a business so that it reaches customers. There has to be a demand <coughs> for that. In Meghalaya, the context, as I said earlier, is where we see maximum potential, is where we see, uh, with reference to the rural economy, is where we see a lot of natural resource-based startups. So whether it be in, the, in terms of energy conservation, as uh, RG uh, said just now, ecotourism. There is also a concept of horticulture tourism. There's also a concept of agriculture tourism. There's a concept of uh, startups which are focused in organics where people come and stay. You have uh, organic resorts. That can also be a startup. It can also vary right from where you actually utilize the natural resources to, to you know, to, to bring clients into and, uh, you know, to bring clients. I, I know a lot of people who would pay around, you know, nothing less than 10,000 a night just to stay in a farm and have the opportunity to till the ground, to, the, to till the soil because mm -hmm. uh, they've been divorced from it uh, by staying in the city. So people, a lot of people long to go back. So you have these eco resorts, you have organic farms, you, are, you have organic farm stays. You have, uh, say for example, in Maharashtra, you have also wine, uh, wine tourism where people come mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, to a winemaker and learn how to make wine wine from the local produce. You also have, and the, the other end of the spectrum is you have processing, where you know uh, you can start from very simple 
basic processing like you know turning your produce into into jams into sauces into squashes and all that to blast freezing to iqf to blanching and then linking them linking all these to a market so for megla there are two things that i see post covid is one is the potential that we have for tourism now the tourism that i'm talking about is not the low end tourist you know i'm talking about high end tourism where people come with a very specific and that's where we need to be able to market we need to change our marketing strategy we need to market megala as a destination for people who want to look who want to come in for wellness like for example in kerala you know you have your wellness tourism where people go to these uh, what do you call them resorts or spas or the the traditional ayurvedic kerala mm. resorts where you detoxify for you know 40 days 45 days and people pay lakhs for that you have that kind of tourism so marketing is one there also see that is also a a, a good opportunity for a startup mm. somebody with market savvy can actually start marketing this kind of Uh, of product megala as a high end tourism destination which hopefully will address this whole issue that we have about you know uh say for example what kong said about you know the the living route bridges being you know so many tourists coming there that actually is getting damaged so without sacrificing our natural resources but yet being able to create sustainable livelihoods at the end of the day we are talking about sustainable livelihoods whether it be a startup or whether it be a farming uh, activity end of the day we are looking at putting money into mm-hmm. people's pockets food in people's stomachs therefore the potential for megala especially having you know the wealth of natural resources that we have the rich soil is something that is uh, startups based you know uh, which are based on natural resources i think these are uh somewhere at the top of the list in fact uh, the business india they last week i think they did a small survey where they said that you know in post covid probably the agriculture sector and uh, you know is probably the only sector that is going to lift the economy up because msmes and you know, manufacturing have taken a huge hit it will take them at least you know about 6 months to a year to recover but with the forecast of the good monsoon they expect that agriculture will be a major contributor to the recovery of the economy and here is where we have a chance here is where as a state we need to realize okay what we've done so far has worked to a certain extent but not is not been perfect we have a chance now to tweak and change and this is the chance that we have to take now so through programs like these is where perhaps we can spread awareness to people make people aware that okay mm-hmm. this you know we need to now sit together Let us talk. Let us discuss. Let us bring our ideas on a platform so that we can actually roll it out. And this is where I would, you know, invite a lot of the young people, because the young people, mm. like what Kong, she she works with young people, so a lot of them are enthusiastic and have a lot of ideas. So I think this is where we need to engage actively with them, mm. because they are our future. So. Uh Kong, I'll put uh, this last question to you. Is that 20 trillion rupees has been announced by the Prime Minister to revive the economy, and a lot of stress has been put on the credit of the MSMEs. But most of uh, our entrepreneurs do not know how to avail, how to avail this this uh, opportunity that they have. So, uh, do you know? Uh, can you please share with us, like, how can they avail these opportunities from the MSMEs? uh i think the first step is registration right registration with the concerned uh, authority and then they apply for these loans which are supposed to be mm-hmm. automatic so i think once they register the process will kick start and they will be able to take it from there so i think that is the first step so the registration is available online yes for the msmes yes it is Okay. So awareness then is the key. So awareness, awareness is the key. So ladies and gentlemen, with that we have almost come towards the end of our topic that is the economic resurgence in rural areas amid the corona pandemic. This is a very delightful uh discussion that we have had. I would like to thank ba- BK Solia, the director of MSME. 
and Gong Vipala. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.